Good morning, guys. Well, it's another rainy, blustery day out there. A good day in the off-season to get procrastinated jobs off the table. And on the agenda today is the plan to remove a bald rear tire on my 95 Vulcan. Now, of course, you can ask the shop to do that for you, but you lose out if you do it that way because you don't get a chance to inspect the brakes. And these old-style drum brakes, you can't inspect them unless the wheel is off. So let's have a look. Let's have a look at the intriguing way, this uh, the simple way that this uh, mechanism works, and we'll go from there. I hope you come along. Now I need this fairly high to get them underneath the rear fender. Now I'll take the license plate off to give myself a little bit more room. Now next step, the dealer's manual calls for removal of this rear muffler. Honestly, I'm not sure it's that critical, but I'm just going to follow the dealer's manual recommendation here. This one's 12 millimeter. First, I'll take off these saddlebags, and again, I'm not sure if it's necessary, but it'll give you guys a better view, so we'll do that mainly, mainly, for, mainly for your benefit. To take the bags off, I need the seat off, so I'll do that now. Here's what this looks like underneath. It just hooks on these two knobs so you have to push down and then out. Right now my chain tension is a little bit loose, but I think I still have a little bit more life in it. Now these notches here, you can see that notch lines up with that scale. And as the chain stretches, you end up having to move it outward. To take the wheel off, we've got to back this completely off so we can get the, give enough slack to get the wheel off of the spindle. This is 12 millimeter for the outside one. Inside one is 14. Same thing on this side. And there's a cotter pin right here. They call this the torque link nut. Here's another cotter pin. We'll try this one. This is the brake rod and the rear brake adjusting nut. We'll take that right off. Next, we have to unhook the speedometer cable. Uh, this is a three millimeter Allen screw. There it is there. Okay, I wondered why we have to take the exhaust off to get this off. Well, two reasons I can think of. One is, the, as I spin this nut out, there may not be enough room against this bracket, and that's limited by the exhaust. And then secondly, how am I going to get a torque wrench on that to properly torque it? I suppose you could uh, get by it, work through it, but I'm going to take the rest of the exhaust off and just make it a little easier. Okay, let's get this axle nut off. This is 22 millimeter. We've moved over to the left side of the vehicle now. We're going to get the uh, chain cover off. These are 8 millimeter, two of them. Okay, I just did this to the point that it wasn't moving any, and now I just need to take a rubber mallet and tap it out from the other side. Okay, I think what's happening is with the weight of the wheel, because the wheel is quite a ways off the ground, this doesn't want to come out, and so I'm going to lower the bike down a little bit so that it takes some of the weight, and then it should just be able to slide out. I've just been using a brass grip punch to just try and work it out. There we are. Now I'll go back up with the bike so that I don't catch the top with the tire here.
we've got lots of room left on these brakes. Just going to clean it up with a little brake clean. I've put it back together again mainly because I don't want dust in the tire shot to get into the inner bearings there and there were some loose pieces so I've just tied it together. I put a couple of spacers in here to allow it to fit properly and they can take it apart if they need to when they put the uh, new tire on but uh, from here I'm going to go and get a new tire put on and I get the wheel balanced and we'll have it back and put it back together again. While I'm getting the new tire on the rim, let me show you how I've got this balanced. It's almost like a tripod with supports on the handlebars holding it up so it can't possibly fall. You can see the blue um, stand that I've got the bike on. And then if I tip you up here, I'll show you how it hooks into the ceiling. Uh, through the trapdoor in the ceiling, I've got a 4x4 across the studs going laterally. And so that's plenty strong and it reaches down to the handlebars there and the handlebars hold it and so it's plenty strong and stable and overall is a winner situation in my garage. Your shop may be different and you may have an alternate method and I'd be interested in what other people have to say about how they uh, balance their bike with the tire off. Almost all manufacturers will print their maximum drum diameter inside the drum and now that we've cleaned it off with brake cleaner we can see that the maximum diameter is 180.75 millimeters and I've measured this all the way around there and we're clearly well below that limit and it's nice and round. I've not had any brake pulsations and the inner surface is perfectly smooth and so I'm going to call this drum good. Now let's look at the brake shoes. I'm measuring all along here and the smallest uh, thickness that I get is about 4.6 millimeters which is well above the minimum threshold of 2.6 and so these shoes are good. If you do end up having to replace them, you replace the entire assembly, this part right here, and it just pries off and you replace it. Now I'm not seeing any evidence of rust here or degeneration. Let me show you how this thing works. When you put your foot on the brake pedal, it's purely mechanical and it pulls on this lever and look what happens. You see that when I pull this bar right here, twist sideways and it pushes the shoes against the inner aspect of the drum on both sides. Pretty simple, isn't it? Brake shoes in cars are quite a bit more complicated than this and they work a bit better, but for a bike, this is all you really need. Now I'm going to have to lube this and I'm going to lube this contact surface here and the question is what lube do you use? In general you use something like brake caliper grease and of course the grease needs to have the property of being stable at high temperatures because these can get really hot and also you want to make sure that you don't muck it around because you don't want to get it everywhere and so I'm just going to put a little dab into here on both sides. And I'll work it through and wipe off the excess because you don't want to get it on the shoes. That looks good. Now the other thing you can do is you can rep uh, remove and uh, clean off this whole lever assembly. And if you do that, you need to mark exactly where you're at because you need to reproduce these positions. But I don't see a point in doing that. This bike has lived indoors the vast majority of its life and I'm not seeing any evidence of dysfunction here. And so I'm just going to put it back together again and call it good. Okay, let me show you something that could be easy to mess up. You see this notch here and a similar one there, 180 degrees opposed. That notch lines up with a male prominence that's deep inside this area, this right in here. There's one here and then one over there. I can't really show that to you better, but it's deep inside there. There's sort of a bump and that bump needs to match up with those gaps. And if it doesn't, the brake shoes are going to be riding too high here. Okay, so let me show you how you can screw this up. I'm just going to put it in without paying attention to that, those, the bump and the notch. And you can see there's about a two millimeter gap there between the outer aspect of the plate and the drum. That's too much. It needs to be better than that. So let's take it off and find, here's the notch. And I can see the bump inside. And so now I'm going to try and line the two up. There, you see that? So now there's a much smaller gap, maybe 
less than a millimeter right there. That's what you want. Now, when I take the shaft out and I move the tire into place, it's going to be a little tricky to maintain this because I can't put the shaft in until the bike is back on, on the frame. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to take some tape and wrap it around here to hold it in place because it's in good place now. I just want to maintain that until I can get the shaft back in. I've had a close look at the chain and it seems to be fine. I'm putting a thin film of silicone grease on this shaft just to let it go in a little bit easier. One of the great things about having a motorcycle lift is you can adjust the height up and down and I think I've got it perfect. Now um, this is the second take because I messed this part up. This little flange needs to go into here before we can get it right and you can't put it in uh, afterwards. So here you slide it in like that first. Don't do what I did. So I'm going to slide this in here now. So you can see my chain is way too loose at the moment and so the way you adjust that is with this nut here and you want it both sides to be parallel. It's really critically important there because that tells you the rear tire is going in parallel with the bike as it goes down the road and so you, there's a mark there and then you can see this hash of marks on this side. So I'm going to tighten up this nut here. So at the moment we're about four notches from the right on both sides, so we're symmetrical. Now let's get the other one's bolts put on before we get too excited about things. Here's the speedo cable right here. Now I did a whole video on the speedo cable, but the point I want to get across is that when the speedo cable is in correct position, this retaining nut sits in that groove and it holds it in place. If you can't get it in pushed, pushed in properly, then just rotate the cable itself like that and the forks will uh, mesh with what's inside. And uh, if you're still having trouble, you might lubricate the O-ring, but I think I can get this. Yeah, that, that felt like it went in. And then you just tighten up the retaining nut. Um, needless to say, this wouldn't be a good one to cross thread, so be real careful. No air tools until you're sure you're in the right threads. Okay, um, now now's a good time to double check and make sure that that crack right there is no more than about a millimeter. I'm going to take off the tape now. It's done what I wanted to do. And um, in terms of uh, a plan here, you want this angle here, this angle there, to be about 80 to 90 degrees. It's a little bit too sharp in my opinion right now. You see when I push down on the brake, that's what I get. And so you, you get the best mechanical advantage. It's about 80 to 90 degrees. It looks like it's about 70 now, so I'll just rotate that a little bit. So just as with regular drum brakes, you can adjust the tightness. That's actually pretty good there. Feels pretty good on the pedal as well. If the pedal is not lined up correctly, you can use um, the other adjustments with the cable. But this is just getting the brake fine, so it's nice and loose. Now, Remember the bike has to be in neutral to be able to do this. And it's a good opportunity as well to inspect the chain more carefully. I've already done that. Once you're sure your belt tension is right, your final adjustment is always done by hand with open end wrenches. And you turn the two against each other so it's nice and tight. You notice I'm doing this at the end. The torque spec on this is 72 foot-pounds. And here's a new cotter pin. We could have reused the old, honestly. Okay, well, I'll break it off there. The rest is pretty straightforward. Now, on that first trip around the block, remember you got a new slick retire and newly adjusted brakes. And if you forgot to take the tape off that drum, you're in for an exciting ride. Now, I think you'll agree that that discount $50 lift turned an awkward two-person job into an easy one-man effort. 
A little tool like that pays for itself in one wheel change, and after that you've got a convenient tool to inspect and lubricate your chain for years to come. You just need to make sure that the bike is well supported so it can't tip over. Of course, the other thing you'll notice is how much faster air tools make this job go. When I think back, I bought most of those air tools in the compressor over 25 years ago, and they're still going strong. Just saying that in that same time, I've thrown three good cordless drills into the recycling trash when batteries failed. Say, I hope this video helped you out. I'd love it if you stopped by to offer a comment. Thanks for watching.